I want to make three claims that are true and that are crucial to the life of the Christian intellectual. Today I'm going to talk about the gospel and the mission of the Christian intellectual. These three claims are going to be foundational for my comments. I won't have time to defend them, so I'm just going to tell you in a very loud and serious voice that they're true, (laughs) and then you can believe me. First, the call of the Christian intellectual is to integrate the whole gospel, all of the riches of the gospel, into all the life and labors of the culture-shaping institutions. That's the call. Secondly, the goal of the Christian intellectual or Christian intellectual leader is faithfulness. So the question for us is, what does it mean for me to be a faithful follower of Jesus? For me as a philosopher, as a husband, as a father, as a member of the body of Christ. That's the goal, faithfulness. It's the very same question that every follower of Christ must ask. What does it mean to follow him faithfully? Third, our commitment. One commitment of the Christian intellectual, not the only commitment, but one has to be to the progress of the gospel. So we have a call to integrate the whole gospel, a goal to be faithful, and one of our commitments, the progress of the gospel. Well, if these claims are true, we need to ask anew, what is the gospel? What is the gospel? At Yale University, the undergraduate ministries with whom we at Rivendell partner quite a bit often hold what they call a freshman forum. And a freshman forum is when there's a Christian student in the residence hall who invites all of the people living around her and to, to have a discussion of a topic. And normally it's some topic about the gospel. How can God be good with so much evil and suffering in the world? Something like this. And then they'll bring somebody in, someone like me or someone else, to talk for five minutes on this topic and then throw it open for questions. And so this one time, I was speaking at this freshman forum and there were about 20 students there, most of whom were not yet followers of Christ. And because I teach philosophy, the the topic got really philosophical really fast because some of the students in philosophy We were talking about free will and determinism and all the things that keep philosophers employed. (laughs) And uh, about an hour into it, a student asked this question. We've talked a lot about God, but why Jesus? That's a great question. Let me tell you what I almost said. I almost, it was on the tip of my tongue, launched into an apologetic based on the historicity of the resurrection of Jesus. Because this apologetic can help support the idea that Jesus was who he claimed to be. And that he was unique among people who walked on the earth. I almost did that, but I didn't. Why Jesus? Okay, suppose you go into Walmart and you want to buy a microwave. What do you want? Now, you might think you want one that matches the appliances on your counter. If you're a male in this room, that probably never occurred to you. (laughs) And you want one that fits under the cabinet. But those aren't what you want. What you want is hot coffee and popped popcorn. That's what you want. Now, what does a salesperson do when you go in to buy a microwave and she's gonna persuade you to buy this certain microwave? Let me tell you what she doesn't do. She doesn't unpack the box, pull out all the styrofoam, 
dig down to the bottom and pull out the manual and flip to the back of the manual. Do you know what's at the back of the manual? The schematic. The schematic is that diagram with all the squiggles that only engineers understand. And it explains how the microwave works. So the salesperson doesn't come in with the schematic and say, let me explain to you how this microwave works. See, the power comes in here and it hits the capacitor, which capacitates it, <laughs> and then goes to the resistor, which resists something. I mean, I don't even know if they use capacitors anymore. Like when I, when I was in high school, um, my brother used to tinker with stuff, he had capacitors, so that's the only word I know. And, and, and then somehow microwaves come out. Why, do, why does the salesperson not do this? It's because you don't care how it works. You just want hot coffee and pops popcorn. So I've kind of asked a few questions about microwaves. Let me make them explicit. What makes it work? What makes it work is the mechanism. Without the mechanism, there's no popped popcorn. There's no microwave without a functioning mechanism. What does it do? Why might you want one? And then the fourth question is, how are these questions related to one another? See, the reason you want a microwave has nothing to do with the details of the mechanism. Now, let's ask these same questions about the gospel. What makes the gospel work? What is the mechanism? In short, it's the atonement. It's Jesus' death on the cross, his resurrection and ascension, for our sins on behalf of us, the substitutionary atonement by which he was able to bear our guilt and we were able to experience forgiveness with God. That's the mechanism. Now, the salesperson doesn't explain the mechanism when she's trying to sell you a microwave because she knows you don't care. But when we share the gospel. Most of the time, we explain the mechanism. Why might a person turn to Jesus? Why Jesus? We think the answer is forgiveness of our sins. And the reason I know we think this is because this is how we explain the gospel to people. Now, we desperately need forgiveness. But to be honest, most people today don't care. If anyone needs forgiveness, it's God, not us. So we are explaining the gospel to people by explaining its mechanism and completely bypassing why someone might be attracted to Jesus. We have to think more deeply and broadly about the gospel. If there's no mechanism, if there's no atonement, there's no Christianity. Without the death and resurrection of Jesus, there is no Christianity. It's essential. It's central. But what does the gospel do is far more than help us move from guilt to forgiveness. I was struck with this a few years ago when I was reading through the gospel of John with a commentary in my devotional time. And then I started to do a little research. In the Gospel of John, the English word for forgive and forgiveness is found in only one verse, the whole Gospel. Way at the end, Jesus says to his disciples, listen to this one, if you forgive their sins, they're forgiven. If you don't, they're not. You know what, nobody knows what that means, right? That's not really true, but it's like, what are you talking about? That's the only time in the whole Gospel of John that the word forgive and the word forgiveness is used. And if I only think about the Gospel in terms of guilt to forgiveness, 
I'm, I'm thinking about a narrow slice of what the gospel does. We need to have what we call at Rivendell a concept of a thick gospel, not a thin gospel. And by thin, we don't mean to be pejorative. It's like an outline. It's thin. You can put it in your back pocket. Carry it around with you. Explains the mechanism of the gospel. But the gospel itself is so much broader than our brief outlines. Always remember, what makes it work is the atonement. There's no gospel without the atonement. But what does God do through the atonement? What has God made possible in Christ for us? So much broader than forgiveness of sins. So in the Gospel of John, we don't hear about forgiveness. What do we hear about? There's one word Jesus uses more than any other to describe who he is and what he's about in John. It's the word life. Immediately, think of all your favorite John passages. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the bread of life. And this is life, that they may know you. Over 30 times in the Gospel of John, Jesus uses the word life. The Gospel is not only about forgiveness. It is about forgiveness. It's about life. And that's a richer, thicker, concept of what God has done for us in Christ than merely going from guilt to forgiveness. See, because Dave mentioned my infatuation with Jane Austen, I have to tell you, I'm a lot like Mr. Bennett in Pride and Prejudice. I don't feel guilty that much. You know the great scene, okay, here's a spoiler alert if you don't know, Lydia runs off with Wickham. Okay, so Lydia runs off with Wickham, and, and Mr. Bennett is crushed. And Elizabeth comes to him and says, Father, don't take so much burden upon yourself. And he says, let me feel for once how much I am to blame. I am not afraid of being overcome by the emotion. It'll pass away soon enough. That's kind of how I am. I don't live my life with a lot of guilt stuff. It just doesn't connect with me. Now, that might show you how depraved I am, but it's just an autobiography, it's just a fact. But I have a desperate and passionate desire for life, for a life that's rich, a life that's meaningful, and this is how Jesus in the Gospel of John articulates what he's about. The Gospel brings, it's much thicker than going from guilty to forgiven. It includes that but it means going from death to life. And then when you flip through the New Testament, especially the letters, you begin to see time and time again, sentences of this form, you were once blank, but now you are blank. You were once dead in your sins, but God made you alive in Christ. You were once far off, but God brought you near. You were strangers and aliens, but you've been adopted as sons. You were once not a people, now you're the people of God. These are what we call gospel transfers. They're pictures of the myriad of things God has done for us in Christ, made possible by the atonement. His death has made possible me to be once without hope, now with hope. Once not a people, now part of the people of God. Think about all the things God has done for us in Christ. So when we talk about, as Christian intellectual leaders, as you all are, integrating the gospel with your work, if you have a narrow view of what the gospel is about, you will not see the resources that the gospel has to reshape culture. You'll only see it through a narrow lens. So my exhortation is to See it through a broad lens. Think about it another way. We claim to believe, I've heard, that Jesus is fully God and fully human. This is what we learn, we embrace it, but let's think about it for a minute. Jesus is fully God. Jesus is fully human. 
If Jesus is fully God, then he gets stuff right. He doesn't mess up. He's a good picture of reality. And if he's fully human, that means every bit of what it means to be a human being is part of God's redemptive plan. Jesus is not just the part of being human that has to do with religious stuff. He's fully human. The gospel touches every bit of our humanity. That's what it means. All of humanity is caught up in the divine redemption drama. Not just are you in or are you out. Not just am I not falling into the most popular sins, which by the way I probably am, but it's everything about being human. Jesus is the paradigm of what it means to be a human. You wanna know how to live a human life? What we were meant to be like? We look at him, fully human. The gospel touches everything. And then another text, this isn't in the Bible, but it's pretty authoritative because it's a Christmas carol, right? It can't be false if it's a Christmas carol. <laughs> All right, so the great hymn, uh, Joy to the World, there's that great verse, he comes to make his blessings known. What's the next line? As far as the curse is found. And then he says it again, because we're not listening. As far as the curse is found. And then one more time, as far are, it's a two-syllable word there, <laughs> as far as the curse is found. Think about that if that's true. As far as the curse of sin touches in the world, that's how far he comes to make his blessings known. That's the scope of God's redemptive concern. That covers my spiritual life, my body, my intellectual life, the environment, institutions, anything where the curse touches is part of God's redemptive concern. Therefore, it's part of our redemptive concern. So to integrate the gospel as Christian intellectual leaders into all the culture-shaping institutions is simply to take seriously the gospel. The reason this comes as news to some Christians is because we have a narrow picture of what the gospel is. We've been so worried about people getting the theory of the atonement right that we forget why it matters. Redemption is for the whole person, for the whole world, for the whole society, institutions, ecosystems. Anything we do in the power of the spirit to roll back evil in this world is an expression of God's redemptive concern. All made possible because Jesus, fully God, fully human, took on the sins of the world, bore them, rose again, and was raised above all rule and authority and every name that is named. So think about the gospel. Meditate on it. How does the gospel take up your work as an engineer, as a doctor, as a pastor? Secondly, think about core identity. I have a short PowerPoint, just so you know, I wasn't born in the 19th century. Um, when we come to Christ, the first slide, the first thing that God touches often is our actions. And sometimes we think of Christianity as a matter of actions. And non-Christians think that we believe the gospel is about not doing the bad stuff and doing the good stuff. The problem is the bad stuff seems more fun and the good stuff seems more boring. Actions. The first, one of the first things God changed in my life was I stopped cheating in school. I was in high school when I came to Christ. So I had a Spanish quiz, and I picked up my desk in the class, walked to the front, and put it down and said, I am not gonna cheat on this quiz, right? The teacher was very proud. I think I got a C minus or something, <laughs> but I didn't cheat. The gospel had not penetrated deep enough for me to study for the quiz. <laughs> But at least I, I didn't cheat. 
actions. The next thing under actions is we learn that our attitudes and our opinions influence our actions. They don't determine them, but they influence them. You know, so you might think, why am I so mean to my roommate? Well, there's some attitude going on there. And then if you hang around Christians long enough and you read the right books, you see the deeper thing is not our attitudes, but our assumptions about reality and our worldview. And our worldview shapes how our attitudes and opinions are formed, and they shape the kind of people we become. Absolutely true. But to be honest, that's not the deepest thing about us. Everyone has two worldviews. The one we talk about and the one we deeply have. Deep in our soul is the fourth thing, what I call core identity. And core identity, it's not a great name, I made it up. What I mean by this is it's our deepest desires, not just beliefs, but desires about who we are and who we want to be. My deepest beliefs and desires about what I want to be is my core identity. And that shapes my worldview. Let me tell you how I know this is true. I got an email from a student who said to me, a Christian student, I'm having a lot of doubts, can we meet? I said, sure. So we got together for lunch, and we talked for about an hour. And I kept asking questions. And it was vague. Yeah, you know, I'm just kind of struggling with this. And, and it just kept going on. It wasn't like, I really don't understand substitutionary atonement. Or, you know, can God make a class so boring that even he falls asleep? I mean, this is the one that's really getting, you know, so it was nothing particular. So finally, I asked the question that you would ask. Tell me about your relationships. Well, I started seeing this woman. She's not a Christian. Well, no wonder he's having doubts. So here's a guy who's been well-trained in the scriptures has this deep assumption and worldview about the authority of scripture, but something captured his affections. He wanted to be loved. He wanted to be in relationship. His deepest desires about who he was was in tension with the things he claimed to believe. We'll always give up our beliefs for our desires. Almost always. Augustine said, If I want to know if a man is good, I don't ask what he believes or what he hopes, but I ask what he loves. Our core identity shapes who we are. If you lose your faith, and some of you will, some of you are already planning on it, but um, if you do, it's going to be be because something has captured your core identity, and when pressure comes on, a wedge is driven between what you say you believe and what you're really deep down wanting to be. Unless Jesus captures our core identity, we are vulnerable. The gospel has to penetrate deeply. So those of us who are aspiring and some of us actual Christian intellectual leaders, we have to learn to hold forth the gospel as something that can capture the deepest passions of a human person. Why might a person turn to Jesus? It's not gonna be the details of the mechanism for most people. That's what makes it work, it's essential. But it's gonna be, what is it that Jesus wants to do with an individual? Wants to take them from alien to adopted as a child of God. From stranger and far away to brought near. All of the things. God does for us in Christ. So think about the gospel, think about core identity. Think about the question, why Jesus? So I didn't launch into the apologetic on the resurrection in this discussion, and I believe it was a God moment for me, because that's how I was trained. I think that stuff is like really super cool and it's true, 
but it was like I was about to. Instead, I told the story. And a leper came to Jesus, beseeching him, and falling on his knees before him, saying, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Moved with compassion, Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I am willing, be clean. And so I had to explain the background of the story, that leprosy made you unclean, and what that meant was cut off from the life of the community. So here's a man with leprosy, uncurable disease, who for a very long time, most likely, was completely cut off from the life of the community. If you had leprosy and walked down the street, apparently, this is what commentators say, and I'm just believing them because they're smarter than me, um, apparently you had to say, look, unclean, unclean, so people could walk around you and not touch you. If you touched a leper, you were unclean and had to be ceremonially washed before you could be restored to the community. So here's a man who's cut off, untouchable. What does the text say? Moved with compassion, Jesus reached out his hand and touched him and then said, I'm willing, be clean. And then I explained to the students, notice that Jesus did not heal him first and then touch him. He touched him first and then healed him. So Jesus touched him while he was still untouchable. And then they just asked this question. Do you know anybody who doesn't sometimes feel untouchable? Think about that picture. That's the gospel. Jesus touches us when we're untouchable. If I had launched into the historicity of the resurrection, we would have stayed on the level of an intellectual debate. If I had talked about guilt and forgiveness of sins, most likely there would have been scoffing because the only one who needs forgiveness is God. But when people begin to see Jesus as someone who might touch me in the secret depth of my soul where I feel untouchable, wow. That's gospel. Made possible because Jesus was fully God, fully human, he bore the sins of the world. But this is what he does for us. He restores us to community. He brings us in. So these facets of the gospel, think about the gospel as a diamond with many facets. These facets have, are the resources to integrate the truth of God with the lives of people. So we have a, a, a concept we call making the gospel connection. I love that phrase because in my own spiritual life, I need to make the gospel connection. I need to see the gospel connect to my core identity and bring Jesus in. In my spiritual formation with others, as I encourage them, help them make the gospel connection. In our evangelism, we help make the gospel connection. See how what God has done for us in Christ actually touches the need. And then in our intellectual work, how does the gospel touch? on the nature of social systems, on poverty, on the environment, on the, on the metaphysical status of persons, on whether there is a will, whether beauty is real. How does the gospel capture these? We have to make the gospel connection. If we have a thin understanding of the gospel, we can only connect in a thin way. We wanna connect in a thick way. We believe the gospel has all the resources within itself to make the connection. So we used to say, you really need to learn about the culture if you wanna engage the culture for Christ. And then it finally dawned, us at, dawned on us at Rivendell we're, we're buried in the culture. We don't need to learn the culture. The failure of Christians to engage the culture with the gospel 
has nothing to do with our lack of understanding of the culture. It has everything to do with our lack of understanding and experience of the riches of the gospel. How can we bring the gospel to bear on the complexities of the world if we only have a shallow and thin understanding? This will change the way you see the scriptures. Every time Paul addresses a problem in one of the churches, he is, in a sense, asking this question, how does the gospel bear on this problem? And you can begin to see it. Well, this is what God has done for us in Christ. So therefore, this is how it ought to be lived out. The engagement of the gospel. So the call of the Christian intellectual is integrate the whole thick gospel with all the life and labors of whatever culture-shaping institution you're a part of. The goal of the Christian intellectual is faithfulness. What does it mean to follow Jesus faithfully? And the commitment is a commitment to the progress of the gospel. Not just progress two-dimensionally, getting it out, spread out a map, we have to get the gospel to all these places, but three-dimensionally, pick any place on the map, it's gotta go deep. But for you future Christian intellectual leaders, it's not just getting the gospel deep at a place, it's the fourth dimension of the progress of the gospel. What are we doing today so that the gospel can penetrate deeply 10 years from now, 30 years from now, 100 years from now? The reason that the average secular student thinks Jesus is utterly irrelevant to her has in part to do with things that happened 150 years ago. What are we doing now so that 150 years from now the gospel has a deeper traction in the lives of people? Commitment to the progress of the gospel. The gospel and the mission of the Christian intellectual, Christian intellectual leaders are about making the gospel connection on every level. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.